Good morning, everyone. Great to see you here. Welcome to 11 a.m. Welcome to church. It's so wonderful we can be together. This is my favorite day of the week. I love Sunday. I love being able to gather with the saints of North Mead Anglican, gathered in this place to sit under God's word. Welcome to you. If you're here for the first time or you're new to our church, we're so glad that you are here with us as we come to look at God's word together in this book of Colossians, a great way for us to start a year together as a church. This is working, right? This one's, that one, can we turn that one off just so I don't get distracted and I feel like I'm doubly loud. I'm already... Okay, is that, that's, I'm coming through. Hopefully you can hear me online as well. Welcome to you guys if you're watching that way as well. How about uh, we get started? So keep your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 1. Keep your handouts open there as well so you can follow along with where we're going uh, this morning. But a few years ago in a small ski town called Vale in North America, a couple of men tried to rob a bank. And they thought they were being intelligent by covering up their identities wearing balaclavas as they robbed uh, this bank. However... Uh, The bank robbing duo actually earned the name Dumb and Dumber by the police due to the trail of clues they left for the police to identify them after the robbery. They failed to disguise, first of all, their distinct Australian accent, despite being the only two Australians living in the town at the time. They were still wearing their work uniforms from the sports store that they worked at locally uh, in town. They also wore their name tags during the robbery so everyone could identify who they were. On top of that, as they fled from the scene, they stopped at some local toilets and took this photo of themselves, posing with all the money they had robbed in the cubicle, so when the police eventually did catch up with them, they couldn't even deny it because the police had this hard evidence. Uh, There's just kind of a certain level of knowledge, awareness of knowledge, these guys just seem to be lacking, because knowledge is important, right? Remember that the next time you decide to rob a bank. But just goes to show you how important knowledge is for our lives. And I guess that's why it's the thing Paul prays for these Christians in this passage. The thing Paul really wants for these Christians is to have knowledge. So how about I pray now that we might have knowledge of our great God, we might have knowledge of His Word, and we might have knowledge of what He wants us to learn today as He speaks to us. So let's talk to God now. Father, we thank You so much for the truth that you reveal through your word, the Bible. We thank you for the light and the life it brings. We ask that we might understand your will, have all spiritual understanding, that we might live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've got to tell you, our passage begins with these words, for this reason, which means Paul is actually referring, he's pointing us back to everything he has just said previously in the chapter. Last week, we actually got to see what Paul gives thanks to God for when he writes this church in Colossae. And we saw that he is so thankful for their faith and their love and the hope that he's heard from Epaphras. Paul describes this guy as his dearly loved fellow servant. I don't know about you, but I would love if I got to the end of my days and people described me in this way, the way Paul describes Epaphras here, as his dearly loved fellow servant and faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. I mean, if you are asked to say something at my funeral, that is what I want said of me. Assuming it's true, I mean, don't lie, don't make it up, uh, but I would love it if you could describe me in this way, dearly loved fellow servant and faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. That is a great description of the Christian minister, isn't it? But see, Paul says, because they have truly come to put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, because of the way they practically and sacrificially love each other as fellow brothers and sisters, as saints of Christ, because of the hope they have, it means they are willing to suffer, they are willing to give up, live in such a way that shows the world they are not living for this one but for the future promises of being with Christ forever. For this reason, says Paul, verse 9, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know, if you have ever needed to be reminded of what you should be praying for people, there it is. I don't know about you, but sometimes my personal prayers just get stuck in the level of mundane. I have that deadline I'm struggling with for church. The kids 
could sleep so much better than they are. Family and friends, health isn't what it should be. Aunt Mabel's ingrown toenail, you know, it's just whatever it is. Those are good things to pray for. And let me assure you, God does love to hear those prayers and he answers them. But if that's all we pray for, I mean, contrast Paul's prayers. Paul prays for three things for these Christians. First, the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Second, that they would walk a life worthy of Christ. And third, that they would have deep, soul-satisfying assurance. See, Paul prays for knowledge. But it's not just any knowledge, but knowledge of God's wisdom, His spiritual wisdom and understanding, and it comes through the Word of God. See, knowledge matters. Jesus says in John chapter 8, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You know what? Knowing God, knowing hope that He has in store for us, knowing God's power, it's actually going to bring complete transformation, says Paul, in your life. The knowledge of God's will. Paul is talking about here the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ Himself. See, we can actually only know God if God makes Himself known. You can't logically deduce if God is there or not. You can't come to kind of some rational argument or use human reason to sit and decide one day that God exists. Because knowing God is relational anyway. It's not just knowing facts about God. Now, I know facts about Tom Hanks and Scott Morrison and Taylor Swift. I don't know any of them. Knowing God is this really profound privilege and blessing that Paul is talking about here. Knowledge can, and it will change your life. It's going to change your mind, he says. It will change your attitudes. It's going to change your motives. It will completely transform your worldview. And ultimately, it's going to change your actions. Because knowledge is powerful. And finding out you're pregnant, knowing you're going to have a baby, that does change your life. It changes how you think. It changes how you behave. It changes, if you're a woman, how often you go to the toilet, how you spend your time. God has made himself known in Christ. That's why Jesus came. He came, he says, to seek and to save the lost. He came so that we would know God and not just know about God. See, God draws himself back through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. That gulf that existed between us is removed. In Christ, he's adopted us as sons and daughters. He's included us in his family through Christ's blood. He has freely given us and made us His children. He has made His known will to us through His Son. That is an extraordinary blessing. We can know God, really know Him. You can call Him your Father if you're a Christian. He became one of us that we might know Him. He died for us that we might know Him. He is speaking now to us through His Word that we might know Him. Just remember, Paul could have prayed a number of things for these Christians in Colossae. Remember, these are not modern times. There would have been loads of sickness. There is no social security system or welfare system to protect those who are poor. There's no amazing modern hospitals or crisp, clean running water in this time. But Paul, what does he pray for them? Non-stop that they will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. That is the most important thing we can pray for one another as Christians. How often is that our prayer? When is the last time you prayed that for someone? For your church, for your husband, for your wife, for your kids, for others in your gospel team, that they might be filled with the knowledge of God's will. But you notice it's not just knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's knowledge that leads to godliness. Verse 10, Paul says, So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in the knowledge of God. 
You know, I love how Paul kind of shapes this verse. I love how his logic works here. He says, he has this kind of cycle. He says, the better you understand the gospel of Jesus, as you come to grasp the hope we have in Christ, as you grow in the knowledge of God and you start to live a life worthy of the gospel, then you will put off sin and you'll put on righteousness. And as you do that, he says, so you will grow in the gospel of Jesus Christ and know the will of God better. See how it works? Know God, start to live His way, know God better. Start to live His way, know God better. It's just this kind of cycle. That's how the gospel works in Paul's mind. And one of the great things about praying this prayer for others is it reminds us that we need it ourselves. As you pray this for other people, you realize you need it too. I need growing in the knowledge of God. And one of the promises that uh, we make that I sometimes like to go over as a, as, a, as a minister, I go back over the promises occasionally that I make on the day that I was ordained. And one of the main promises we make is that we will do our quiet times. We promise to commit ourselves to the diligent study of Scriptures and to prayer. One of the things that you're giving, that your partnership with us here at Northmead does, is it allows us as a staff team to do our quiet times with God. It allows us to be word-drenched ministers so that as we minister to you through the Word of God, we ourselves are being changed and rebuked and encouraged and grown and challenged by the same Word we seek to speak into your lives. But more than this, praying this prayer reminds me as a minister, what is my primary role? What's my primary job as a pastor teacher is to teach scriptures. And you see, if we want to see gospel growth in this congregation at 11 and across our church at Northmead, there is no shortcuts. There's no silver bullet. There is no program that we can implement, no pathway that we can establish. There is no course that we can run that is miraculously going to see 11 a.m. grow 50% in godliness by the end of 2021. It is only when people in our church grow in the knowledge of the gospel, it is only when you have word-drenched lives, it is only when we as Christians know God's word better and live to please Him in every way that we'll grow in godliness. There is no shortcuts to this godliness. And so we preach and we speak the gospel into each other's lives. And as you do that, God's Word will do its work. Back to our verse. Paul's prayer doesn't end there. So after praying this prayer that it will bear fruit and grow in the knowledge of God, he prays that they might, verse 11, be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might. Paul wants them to know God's power. And it's God's power that strengthens them to follow Christ. You see, all of God's power, His his spectacular strength, His might is directed in bringing about our endurance and our patience as Christians. I mean, just think about that for a second. God has all the power there is. And He uses that power, He commands that power that He used to rip Jesus Christ out of the grave, that power that He used to smash the chains of sin and death, and establish Jesus as King and Lord of Lords, that same power He uses to produce patience and endurance to those who follow Him. You know, when I uh, did athletics in school, it's actually more accurate to say when they made me do athletics at school, uh, I was never much of a sprinter. Now, I know that comes as a real revelation to you all in this room. What? No way, buddy. We can tell that you were awesome. Uh, But what's maybe more of a revelation to you was I was actually quite good at the long-distance events. Uh, And the reason being, my sheer determination and my competitive spirit was able to overcome my lack of genetics for athletics in general. But the sprinting events, they just weren't long enough. And it's the same in the Christian life. There is no place for sprinters in the Christian life. This is a long-distance race. And that's why the end point of this prayer 
is that we would have endurance and patience. Because life, this side of Christ's return, I've got to tell you, it's going to be hard. There will be troubles and sufferings in this life. Jesus does not offer you an easy life as a Christian. In fact, he says the opposite. He says, take up your cross. Be willing to lose your life for me and for the sake of the gospel. I don't know what you might be going through at the moment that you might need to hear that right now. Christ doesn't offer an easy life. But more than just need to hear that, I think as Christians in this world that we face and the struggles that we face, we need to be praying for one another, that we would endure as followers of Christ in the tough times. I mean, I do hope that is what you're praying for one another. It's what I pray for you, that you would endure with patience in the gospel. And this prayer is that God will strengthen those who trust Him, that they would strengthen us to endure anything and everything, so that whatever happens, we might faithfully be standing on that day Christ returns. You know, it's, I think it's funny, when you hear those words, endure and patience, kind of, I'm not sure what images come to my mind, is that kind of long-suffering, stoic kind of image of a person's face. The person that comes to mind for me is the actress Maggie Smith. I'm not sure you know who she is. She plays Professor McGonagall in the Harry Potter series. You know, that stern-looking face. She might be in Down and Abbey. I should have gotten a picture up. It's too late now. But she's just got this face that when I think of patience and endurance, I think of her. And sadly... I think that's the picture that many people have of the Christian life in this world. But look down at Paul's prayer. That's not his prayer here. The prayer is not that we would be strengthened to endure begrudgingly this life that he gives us. But the end of verse 11, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled us to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. So you want to say, if faith, love and hope are the three key markers of what it means to be a Christian, then thankfulness and joy round out the top five. Because how could you not be joyful if you know what God has done for you in giving you a place in His kingdom? See, how could you not be thankful knowing that He has rescued you from the kingdom of darkness and brought you into the kingdom of the Son He loves? True hope only comes from the hope that we have in Christ. You know, I want us to be a, joy, a joyful, filled church. I would love it if people came in and said, those people are filled with so much joy because of the hope they have in Christ. It is soul satisfying and it is obvious. But this type of joy is not something that we can manufacture within you as Christians. I mean, we could try. We could try to play music a bit more upbeat repeat the chorus time and time and time again. But true joy and thankfulness only flow from the hope that we have in Christ. The only way to have this hope is to know the will of God, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Because just like faith and just like love, joy and thankfulness flow from that hope. Well, the final thing that he prays for these Christians is that they would have the deepest assurance. Verse 13, he says, He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, Paul wants these Christians to realize that when we come to Christ, then we are fit for the kingdom of God. We have been qualified assured of a place in, in, in God's heavenly reality. We're in. We've got the birth certificate. We've got the citizenship. We've got the passport. We now belong to the kingdom of the Son He loves because of what He has done. And you know, Paul describes this, this change of situation as like a complete transformation of citizenships in our reality. It's this image of two realms. There is the kingdom of darkness over here, he says, and God has taken you from that and transferred you into the kingdom of the Son that He loves. 
And as a Christian, that is a radical transformation in your life. This is not some small change that you just woke up one morning and thought, now I'm in the kingdom of the son he loves. It's not like you woke up this morning and decided, I no longer hate coffee. And now all I want is a cold brew every day and, and kind of, this, un, kind of uh, this decision to move down to Melbourne for some reason. No one can understand. It's a huge transformation. You know what? It's, you might not know about this about me, but you probably do. I love the NRL. And in particular, I love the Sydney Roosters. Greatest football team in the competition. There's no one like them. Won two premierships back to back, somehow manages to keep them under the salary cap all the time and still be the best team on the field. It's incredible. I despise the Sydney Rabbitohs. They are the worst team in the competition. I cannot stand them for my life. Whenever we're on the field, I just, I just want to see them lose. I want to beat them every single time. This transformation is like me waking up and coming up to you next Sunday and saying, you know what, I've decided they were right. The roosters are the worst. They've got the silver spoon in their mouth. They're, kind of bre- they're a bunch of cheaters. I'm going to the South Sydney Rabbitohs from now on. I'm changing legends. I'm buying, their, I'm buying their jersey. I'm getting a membership. I'm going to every game. I'm going to fight for them no matter what. They are the greatest team. It is a radical transformation. It would be a radical transformation in my life, and it's never going to happen, just so you're clear. This transformation is so much bigger. He has transferred us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. It is massive because by nature, we prefer the dark. By nature, we are children of wrath. By nature, we love to live our own way. By nature, we were once a part of the kingdom that Satan ruled and sin reigns. But now... God has transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And he knows the way in which we enter this new kingdom. The means of entry is the forgiveness of sins and God is the agent. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He has transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. In Christ, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. And the reason this is such great assurance for you as a Christian is because do you notice that God has already done this all for us? Verse 12, it is not God will enable you, God has enabled you. Then verse 13, it's not God will rescue you, but God has rescued you and transferred you. Verse 14, it's not you will have redemption, you have redemption. Your sins are now forgiven. It is so important for us to hear this as Christians. God has enabled, God has rescued, God has redeemed. I want to say, if you ever meet anybody who comes up to you and says, you need something more than Christ because you are so word-drenched in your own life, you would pull out the Bible, rip out Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 to 14, and say, read that. Let no one take that away from you, says Paul. Be assured, have full confidence Here we find a prayer that should be on our hearts as a church and on our lips for one another. And God will answer this prayer. He will answer this prayer as the word is faithfully and lovingly proclaimed here on a Sunday each week. In our small groups, our gospel teams, in our kids and youth ministries, in our families and in our lives, let the word of God do its work. Let's pray. Father, we do pray once again that you'll give us knowledge of your will that comes through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to live lives that are worthy of the gospel and that we might have full assurance of the hope we have in your Son, whom you dearly love. We pray this in his name. Amen. We're going to continue to pray uh, to our great God.